everyone and welcome back. So today we're going to be going through our part two of going back to work series that talks all about separation anxiety. So before I get started, well, we give everybody a minute or so to bump on. Um, how many people here have watched part one of the separation anxiety assessment? Um, is anybody uh, unsure if their dog has separation anxiety based upon the bits that we gave you in the first part? I would love to hear about that because that could be a part three where we take in some video samples from people and discuss body language because that is a tough part for a lot of folks. And the, one of the big things that I'm teaching people as we're working together. So we give everybody a little minute here or so. Okay. All right. So I can't always see all the comments I've noticed from Facebook as they don't seem to always pop up right away into my little comment window. I know there is a delay, but for some reason or other, they don't always pop up there and I have to check afterwards. So if ever your comment is not answered, um, I do go in afterwards to check out the recording to be sure that all of them were answered. Uh, pretty sure uh, Penny does have separation anxiety. Yeah, I agree too there, Victoria, um, from the videos you sent. Um, she's definitely a tough one because she's attached to one person, but mostly Kyle. Um, so that is true separation anxiety, which is what we helped to define and talk about the difference between separation anxiety and isolation distress um, in part one. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with part two. So here is part two. We are going to talk about what you can do now to keep it at bay. Um, quick fix myths, cause boy, are they rampant out there. Um, we're gonna talk about what really works and how to be sure that you're finding uh, qualified help. As a quick re reminder, this is what we went through on part one. We went through discussing what separation anxiety or isolation distress is, what else it can look like, hint, bored dog, um, and um, how you can determine if your dog has separation anxiety or isolation distress. So if you've got questions about that, please do go to part one. We really dig in there, but we're gonna jump off of that point and we're going to now go into part two of busting those quick fix myths, what really works, hashtag science, what you can do now to keep it at bay, um, and how to find that qualified help. Okay, so myth versus reality. Um, number one, getting another dog. Uh, many people think that that is going to help their dog that is having alone time issues. But reality is separation anxiety or isolation distress is an anxiety disorder where a dog will panic if away from their owner or a person. Yes, sometimes another dog can help, but it is rare. When my own personal dog developed separation anxiety, we were a four dog, four dog household and everybody liked each other and got along just fine. She did not care that they were around. It was about her humans. So if you are seriously considering getting another dog, I do recommend that you think through all of it and think about all the additional things, medical and behavior wise, another dog can bring if the only reason that you are thinking about getting another dog is to help fix dog number one. Um, okay, so myth number two, um, get a stronger crate. Oh, this breaks my heart. You will see all kinds of different uh, systems out there. People are recommending carabiners to zip ties to these Alcatraz type crates that they consider indestructible. Um, and that's not fixing your dog's separation anxiety. That's not changing how they feel. If we're lucky, it contains the panic attack. Um, but many dogs have severely injured themselves trying to escape out of these crates when they're panicking. 
And then in addition to your behavior bills, trying to figure this out and get it fixed, you now have medical bills. Um, we have had dogs jump out windows. Um, we have had dogs break teeth getting out of crates. We have had them destroy doors completely and gotten on the other side. They are not thinking reasonably. They are having a panic attack. Um, so that they're not a crate is not going to stop them. So getting that that stronger, that tougher crate is not the solution. Myth number four: board and train. They'll fix it. Um, and I will bet you there's a bunch of them out there that will promise that they can fix it. But um, the reality is, that remember that it's about you and all the little bits you do before and as you leave. People cannot replicate this in their home, in a board and train facility. Plus, unfortunately, the vast majority of board and train options out there are aversive based. Hence the picture I chose. There are no certi certified, no certified humane professional would take on a separation anxiety client as a board and train because they know that the reason that the dog is upset is it's about you and all the things that lead up to you leaving. So they know they can't fix it and they're not going to give, make promises and, and try. All right, myth number five, you cause this. Oh, I hear this all the time and this breaks my heart as much as the, the Alcatraz crate. You did not cause this. Um, this is one of the most researched behavior issues in the canine world and we still don't know exactly why it is caused, but we do know the commonalities here that I have listed. These are the common things, threads that they find and guess what? They also do ask owners, does your dog sleep in bed with you? Does your dog walk through the door first? Does your dog have to sit to say please for everything? They are tracking all those things and look at, they did not make this list because none of those things have any bearing on if your dog has separation anxiety or not. Um, so big things to repeat it and go through the list, you know, change in household members that naturally changes routines, be it a human household member or a dog household member, change of residence, be it a dog is being rehomed or frankly you move to a new home with your dog. That's another big picture change, routines, sounds, smells, genetic predisposition. This seems to be the one that we keep coming back to and finding as is, is the thing, this genetic predisposition. Early life environment, noise phobia. It does seem to happen in conjunction with separation anxiety. I don't know if it's because they are more sensitive to sounds and things like that, that they're exacerbated when they're alone. Um, I'm not sure. They're, again, they're still trying to figure this out. Old age or pain onset. You know, if you suddenly aren't feeling very well, if, this, if your dog suddenly developed this, um, that is definitely something to go to your medical um, professional, your, uh, <laughs> your veterinarian, and have them check to rule out if there's any medical causes. A sudden long presence or absence. Yes, and that is why everybody is worried because of this pandemic, with everybody having to stay home as much as possible, working from home, and then the potential of you suddenly not being home anymore. Um, and this happens, you know, kind of on the regular with families in particular, where let's say um, the kids are all home for the summer and, and then they all go back to school, uh, uh, vacations, some, you know, like if you take a month long um, holiday for the, whatever holidays that you're celebrating or just for a vacation, and then all of a sudden you go back to work again. Those are sudden presence or absence events for our dogs that are big routine changes. Um, and then having a traumatic event while they're alone. So again, you did not cause this. There are many factors and notice you are not in there unless, you know, you, you, there's things that are out of your control here, you know, moving, um, early life, 
experiences. There's only so much that you have control over. So we'll go on to science. So this is where you, um, we are going to focus on to talk about the things that do work to change how our dogs feel about being alone. So I'm gonna give you a quick brief overview of how dogs learn. Any dog trainer that is taking your money should know this, period. Dogs learn by associations and by consequences. They are fabulous at observing us and connecting dots. And when it comes to separation anxiety, boy, are we pattern makers. Um, so it's really easy for them to connect all of the dots that lead up to us leaving. Every time mom puts on that pair of shoes, she's going to leave and she's going to leave for eight hours. And when she leaves, I panic. So you will have dogs that will start pacing or panting or shaking when specific shoes are put on or when your purse is picked up or when your keys and so on. Dogs also learn by consequences. When a dog does something, um, there is a consequence to their action. So if I scratched at the crate um, enough, I will get out. <laughs> Be it either you're home and you're letting them out or they're breaking free. And they're doing that, you know, if they are clawing at their crate because they are anxious, they're doing it to try and relieve their stress. And then that way of stress relief works. So it's never one or the other. They're always both working at the same time. Notice here how there is nothing about our dogs being mad or spiteful for us leaving them. Our dogs don't think like that. And I always say that we are very lucky and very fortunate that they don't. This is how they learn. They're, this is the two ways. It's very simple, but man, are they good at it. Okay, so when it comes to us wanting to change how our dogs feel about alone time, we are going to focus on the association part. And we are specifically going to focus on the technique called desensitization. Desensitization is about gradually exposing the dog to something it fears, but bold in caps, at an intensity does, the, does not induce fear. Now this is a very important, and this is really hard when it's alone time. When Mary Lou first developed separation anxiety, and I was told that I needed to stop her from having a panic attack when I left, and that meant that I could not leave her home alone for longer than she could handle, I thought they were insane. I was like, how can anybody do that? Well, guess what? I figured out ways <laughs> and it wasn't forever um, and, <laughs> and it was worth it. <laughs> um, and the other thing um, is that it is a big part of how we're going to help them to start feeling better. If you are working your tail off, trying to change how your dog feels about you leaving and them being left alone. But once a week you do live, leave them alone for your eight hour work day and they panic for that entire eight hours, it's going to be like you are trying to fill up a gallon bucket with a hole in the bottom. You are not just going to be treading water. You're not going to make progress. So you have to build a village, figure out how to do this. But I have many, many, many clients, as do my colleagues who have figured this out. Everybody has a different situation, but you can figure it out. I have a wonderful couple right now that both work nights. Can you imagine how difficult it was initially for them to find somebody who can help them to watch their dog overnight? Yeah, it's not easy, but they figured it out because they knew that this is what was going to help their dog. Okay, the other thing um, that can help 
part of the desensitization process is speaking with your DVM about adjunct supportive medication options. With separation anxiety being a bona fide phobia, many of our dogs really benefit from the support of medication. And I always say that uh, when I'm speaking with my clients about medication, that I have never had a client say, I wish I wouldn't have started meds. I wish I would have waited. In fact, I frequently get, I wish I would have started sooner. <laughs> oh my gosh, if I only would have got meds on board, we would have started to make progress so much faster. Meds are helpful for this process. It helps to bring them down from constantly panicking and getting the heck off that roller coaster so that if they do have a little bit of a stressful event, we do push them a bit past their threshold, they can come back off of that rather than then just losing it and being like, nope, game over. They learn how to cope and adjust um, and the meds help them with that along with the training. Meds do not work on their own, um, so they, they really don't. I wish they did. Man, that would be awesome. <laughs> Just give me a pill and make me better. But it'd be like telling somebody with depression that you, they could get better with, here's just a pill. You don't need to talk to anybody about it and learn how to change your own behavior and your own thought process. It's the same for our dogs. Okay, so then... Desensitization, big part of it is about the whole keeping them under the threshold, right? We don't want to be inducing fears. So how do we do that? So we break it down. We, uh, when I'm working with my clients, we start out with a little assessment to figure out where the dog is now, what can they do, what is the most difficult things for them. We work out all of the different pre-departure cues, the things that her, their people do before they leave, we write it all out on a list, and then we say, okay, what is the bare minimum we need to get you out that door so we can focus on building duration? Now, that's obviously gonna be a little bit different for everybody, depending upon A, the dog, and B, where you live. So right now, my clients that are in, you know, uh, Wisconsin here, it's very cold out. You can't be stepping out with just your, your socks, <laughs> even if you're hardy. It is pretty darn cold out there right now. Um, so that's going to have a big factor. And how many of those pre-departure cues do we have to layer on from the get-go and get your dog okay with? before we can actually get you fully out that door on the other side and building that duration. Then the next part is that we are gradually going to expose the dogs, being sure to keep them under threshold and they dictate the pace. How do we know that we're going at their pace? By observing their body language to uh, and being able to tell if they are comfortable or not. Their body, learning their body language is really, really important. And it takes practice. And while each dog, um, it, it, while all dogs have like a general language, each dog has something a little bit different. They have their own little, like I say, slang or dialect as to the way they do things. So you have to get to know your dog really well and what little signals that they are giving that they're starting to get a little bit stressed. Because if we are constantly pushing them over that threshold, we're not telling them that it's safe and we're not going to be building up alone time. So you have to keep it gradual. So while you're keeping it gradual, you have to be very systematic about it. You can't just be one second, two second, three second, four second, and constantly making it every step harder as you go along. That's just going to be too tough for them. That's just not how you're going to make a dog um, desensitized to something. 
Um, to make it systematic, you have to write a plan. Um, remember earlier I said that we are really great pattern makers and our dogs are really good at observing those patterns and connecting those dots. Well, it's like it's in our, our DNA to make patterns. So if even if we're trying really hard not to make patterns, it we inevitably do. So you need to write it down and not go off the cuff. So each time that a client is working with me um, and they're doing one of their daily homework assignments, they are not just winging it. I have written down specifically what they are going to do and I decide exactly what they're going to do based on how their dog did the day before, as well as lots of other factors such as time of day, who's doing the homework, um, what sort of exercise, mental or physical, that they have may have gotten that day, um, other things, um, you know, how, what sort of foundation we have built up, can we do something that's a little bit more difficult for them, maybe at the start, or do we gotta slowly warm them up, give them a little break, and then do that final big duration out? So there's lots of factors that come into writing a plan, and getting help on understanding how to write that plan is important. Okay, so what doesn't work? <laughs> so and gosh, this is going to be your, your, all these things that people are going to tell you are going to work. Um, so crate training, I think we kind of addressed that. I mean, unless your dog has an anxiety with the crate specifically, and that's why your dog is showing these behavior symptoms that look like separation anxiety. It could be that your dog has just not properly been introduced to the crate. Um, other things, herbs or supplements. Oy, and let me tell you, I... I tried this. I was very against meds when I first started out. I was all about doing everything naturally. And I spent probably about a year trying all these different herbs and supplements, um, mixtures to sprinkle on my dog's food, changing her food, uh, all of that. I tried all of that. And a good equation for this, and in, in, in my opinion, <laughs> after having seen the light is that it using herbs or supplements for a dog who is having a panic attack is like using lavender oil for a migraine. It is just not going to work. You need tried and true tested medication that has been through the FDA process and is regularly test, rigorously tested to help you actually recover from my migraine. Lavender is not going to cut it. Sorry, guys. Um, ignoring them. Oh, I hear this one all the time. You know, ignore your dog. You know, they're, if they, when you come home, just completely ignore them. You know, if they try to solicit any attention from you while you're, you're home with them all day, just ignore them. Give no pets. And if you do give them any pets, make them work for it. What? That's, that's crazy. You know, our, we bring our dogs into our lives because they're social creatures and we made them that way. And now we're telling them that they can't get our love and affection and being social with us. Um, and this is especially hard if you would just suddenly decide that this is the way to go. Your dog is used to sitting with you on the couch, um, hanging out, snuggling, greeting you with kisses when you come home, and all of a sudden you turn into um, you turn into a, a robot, <laughs> they're going to be confused and frustrated and probably upset. Um, so, and I have seen um, this been tried, you know, when people are just running out of options, like, man, I don't know, somebody said this, let me try this. Um, and I've seen dogs get worse with this because they get even more anxious because that person, that safe person, um, is no longer helping them and comforting them to help them feel better. Um, letting them cry it out. Oof. So that, that one is a big one too. No, they'll, they'll get used to it. Just let them cry it out. They'll realize that you're coming home. 
I especially hear this with young dogs with puppies because people don't think that puppies can have separation anxiety, that you, that they just can't, <laughs> which if you think about the huge change that a puppy is going through and then all of a sudden are in your home, that is one major, major routine and life change for them. So yes, puppies can get separation anxiety too. And in fact, I've had several clients with puppies that have this separation anxiety and you know, letting them cry, trying to let them cry it out when, when they're having a panic attack is not going to help them feel better. Um, if anything, they will end up um, being quiet because they're exhausted. Um, and then as soon as they wake up and gain energy again, they're going to be panicking again. So letting them cry it out is not, is not helpful. Um, long lasting food rewards or just food rewards in general. So, you know, like Kongs or uh, different remote feeders or anything um, that you can think of that's a, like a longer lasting Kong or some people will um, scatter food and have them hunt for it. Uh, it tends to work until the food is gone. Uh, so many times people will say, oh, my dog is good for about 20 minutes and then they start to panic. Well, if you actually time how long it takes for the average dog to finish a fully well-packed Kong, 20 minutes is about the thing. Um, and that, so, so it, if your dog is truly having separation anxiety or isolation distress, a Kong is not going to help. And in fact, a Kong can become a pre-departure cue that you're about to leave. And you can get dogs who start to get um, anxious and stressed just by the sight of it. Um, and, you know, for the dogs that won't eat you know, and they have anorexia when you leave, the Kong is doing nothing for them, right? <laughs> so long lasting free rewards won't help. Um, punishing them for the behaviors. Dogs, when they learn by consequences, the consequence has to be immediate. So, you know, unless you're gonna, I mean, you know, and adding, <laughs> I pause here, sorry. And um, added, adding something scary when a dog is panicking is also not going to uh, make them feel less panicky. Um, you, you, maybe if you yell, you will startle them, <laughs> but that is not going to change how they feel. And remember the stuff that they're doing, like, you know, chewing doors and wood frames and um, breaking out of their crate, they're not doing it because they're bored. They're doing it because they're trying to relieve their stress and they're freaking out. Um, so getting mad at them is not gonna help the case at all. It should be a sign instead that you need to reach out for professional help. Um, relaxation training. Um, relaxation training. So there's a, you know, it's, it's basically like teaching a dog to downstay on a mat, which is my, my next one, but adding in uh, what, what is considered like a non-pattern systematic distractions, like you moving around, you jumping up and down, you going out of sight for a second and that sort of thing. Um, well, that, while that may help to build a solid downstay for a dog while you were there, I do not believe that it helps dogs to feel comfortable while they're alone. I would not ask a dog to do a downstay for eight hours while I was gone at work. So I'm um, teaching a down and stay um, from everything that I have read and personally experienced because I also tried that. <laughs> I tried teaching the downstay on the mat and slowly walking away and short departures out on the other side of the door for Mary Lou and that was not working either. So again, over a year of me trying all this stuff. So it's not just me saying, I was told that this doesn't work. I really tried it. Um, I really tried everything. Uh, so, <laughs> so experience and also from research. Um, again, one of the most researched behaviors topics out there. There is, and hopefully more, hopefully they keep um, doing more research because this really is very prevalent with our dogs. 
Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna pause for a sec. Um, let's see here. No, we'll just keep going. There's only two more slides. Okay, so keeping it at bay. Um, so start now. Don't assume because your dog never had an issue that they won't now. And I really wanna stress that because the reason I almost paused was that I um, was, let me see. The reason I almost paused was because I think that people are worried that everybody, all dogs out there are going to suddenly have separation anxiety or isolation distress. I don't think that they will, but I think that people are becoming more aware of this issue with their dogs and they are learning more about how to observe their dog's body language and are just becoming more aware of the things that they may not have been aware of before. So I believe that there are a lot more dogs with separation anxiety out there that just haven't been diagnosed and are not getting help. So I think we are going to see a big surge, um, but, but I think it's just because more because we're aware of it. And because we have the ability, or, or many of us, not all of us, but many of us have the ability um, right now to be able to be doing some working from home and suspending those absences and taking short trips. Um, so we're noticing these, these changes in our dogs that we may not have noticed before after working eight plus hours and coming home exhausted. So, so that's my spiel about the, not everybody's going to get it. I, I really don't think they are. I think there's just going to be more dogs who are already predisposed to it or who are, were already experiencing it. And, and now owners are going to be more aware of it. So start now, coming back to the start now, observe and record their body language via a self-assessment, which we talked about how to do in part one or enlist a pro for help. The green or green with some yellow light body language, this is where I would start with short, easy durations, four to five times a week, uh, keeping eyes on them. So if your dog is basically in the green, every almost everything you see was him relaxed or her. Uh, we're not expecting zombie dogs. Uh, we just want to see calm, relaxed, moving about behaviors, um, relaxing on the couch, playing and engaging with their toys. Um, then I would say, you know, t going and taking a trip to the grocery store, going for a little drive by yourself, going for a walk by yourself, doing some nice short ones. And, you know, if they're really, really for sure in the green, you could even just do this three times a week and then get closer to the four or five times a week as it gets closer to you actually going physically back to work where you leave the home. But keeping your eyes on them as you're practicing this stuff to be sure that they are doing okay. Um, and we talked about how to keep your eyes on them also in point one. It's not using ESP or whatever. <laughs> um, so the part, point three is mostly yellow or any red body language, that's when you wanna reach out right away. You need to get help right away from a professional who can guide you on getting a solid foundation and teaching you the skills and how to continue this um, either with them or on your own. And that's a big part that I stress with my clients is that this is going to take a long time my goal is to give you those skills so that when you are ready, you can continue on your own. So you don't need me there as your, as your um, teacher over your shoulder every, every step of the way until we get your dog fully comfortable. Okay, so how to find qualified help. Buyer beware, the dog training industry is unregulated. The number of times I say that per week, if I could get a quarter, I would be, I would be rich. <laughs> so literally anybody can call themselves a dog trainer and not have any repercussions for it. So you as a 
dog guardian have to be a smart shopper. You have to ask questions. If they give you, you know, these gobbledygook answers or don't seem to really answer, ask more, ask again. You want to know what will happen to your dog if they do something that that trainer deems not appropriate. What if the dog jumps on them? What if the dog barks while they are in a crate? What if their dog barks at another dog? That sort of thing. You want to know exactly what is going to happen to your dog and make sure they are clear with it. Uh, we want to have you Google certifications. There is a lot of different certifications out there or you see a lot of different letters after people's names. There are certifications and then there's memberships, there's certificates and then there's school and programs. There's lots of different stuff. Um, so when you see that somebody has a certification or has certain things that they are listing, actually look those up. What is this, this group or this person that has given this person this certificate? What is their mission? What is their code of conduct? Those are the sort of things you want to look for. Um, and, and the reason you have to look at all these is because, again, anybody can call themselves a dog trainer. Um, and heck, they can use whatever word they want to make up. Behavioralist, um, dog life coach, you know, all of these different things. And if you actually look at who can call themselves a behaviorist, <laughs> it is very restricted to people with PhDs and, and uh, doctor degrees. So you can't call yourself a behaviorist. Um, anyways, off on a tangent, sorry. Um, keep searching until you find a professional that has formal education and specializes in separation anxiety. Um, people more and more now are getting into specializing into behaviors and not trying to be the catch-all, which I think is great. It's, it's like having going to a restaurant and there's a five page menu and you're just like, whoa, there's so much selection here. How can they do all of them well? <laughs> so I'm, I'm a big fan of people specializing in things, um, specializing in um, basic manners and obedience. That's in high demand, focusing on um, tricks or rally or agility or show dogs, um, focusing strictly on separation anxiety. I've got colleagues who that's all they take. Um, I've got colleagues that only work with fear and aggression. Um, there's multiple different specialties. So really look to see you know, what education they have. Do they have the education to help you with separation anxiety? And please, uh, attending have them having attended a webinar or read a book, that is not enough. You could do that. Can you fix your dog after by yourself after watching a web webinar or reading a book? No, most of you can't. So um, those are extra as um, extra helpful bits to a person's education that does not make them a specialist. Um, so Look for trainers or consultants that have the abbreviations CSAT or SA Pro out after them. Those are two programs that I have personally taken and graduated from um, and that are both excellent programs. And then really focused in on specializing in separation anxiety um, and work together as a, as a team of trainers who are specializing in this to work together to help you. So I love both of those programs. Okay. Um, and yes, there are other people who specialize in separation anxiety who haven't done those programs. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get comments on that. Yes, I know that. Okay. So now I'm going to open it up for any questions. If any of our viewers that are here live have any questions for me at all about any of the stuff that I presented. It is a bit to absorb. Um, I know I didn't go specifically into showing you exactly what one person does to um, work through a training plan and I gave you the 
overview of what it looks like and what training technique we use. But that is something that um, I have reached out to some of my, my clients to personally ask if they'd be willing to share video and share some of their progress. And they are because they're very proud of their work and they should be. They're working very hard. So I would love to show folks that. Um, if you want to send us video for highlights on your red, yellow, or green behaviors that you observed with your dogs. Um, here is some of those as a quick refresher. Very comfortable, relaxed, and bored for the green. We have got the red, which is mostly uncomfortable or very uncomfortable. This is our dogs when they are panicking, they're frantic or, or relentless with the behaviors that they're doing. And the yellow, which is somewhere in the middle. So we don't mind some yellow. We don't want them all in yellow. We prefer to have them more in the green. Every once in a while, some yellow would be okay. All right, looks like we got some questions from Caroline. Uh, my dog barks when he's downstairs and I'm upstairs. Does that qualify as leaving? Okay, just wait, Should the, there's a part two. Um, if the dog is almost 10 years old, has never lived alone, how much progress can he make? Okay, so let's take it first with the the, the Point one. So it does not qualify as you leaving if you go upstairs and he's downstairs. Um, if your dog has, ha, if you're working on separation anxiety, he will, um, that's not, a, uh, is not the equivalent of him being alone. Some dogs can be a little frustrated or um, anxious from being separated from their people. So if you are upstairs with a door closed or something like that, you could see some, some behaviors that your dog is not comfortable with that, but that would not include you leaving and leaving him alone for work so, or you know an errand or whatever. Um, to practice alone time for separation anxiety, you physically need to leave. But saying that, not all dogs can automatically start with you actually walking out that door. A lot of my clients will start with essentially teaching them that all of the stuff that leads up to them leaving and including opening and closing the door, but not exiting are boring. Some dogs, that's where we have to start rather than being on the other side of the door for a second or two. And that's how small that these little steps are going to be to start out with. We really have to teach them that it's nothing to panic about and that in fact, it's boring. We want them, we want you to be bored too and be like, oh my God, this is so boring and watching paint dry. Okay, so that is what qualifies as things to teach your dog that you're um, leaving. So not the upstairs part. And in fact, I've had folks that, you know, have like one person um, maybe who is sleeping from an overnight shift and then the other person wants to work on their homework, but the dog knows somebody's home. They can smell them, they know they're there, even if they're in a different room, so it doesn't end up counting as the dog feeling like they're alone. They got good sniffers on them. Okay, then the, let's see here. Then the part two for Caroline's question was, the dog is almost 10 years old and has never lived alone. How much progress can he make? Uh, I, it depends on the dog. I hate saying it depends, it's like, my least two favorite words, but it, 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 it does. It depends on the dog. Are you, are you qualifying has never lived alone as in has never ever had a human leave them alone or never lived alone that they have always lived with another dog. Um, so that would help me. But um, once I'll give you a minute or so to answer that, but how much progress can he make is it's going to be dependent upon the dog because you know you know has he been panicking for 10 years 
<laughs> versus has he never been alone for 10 years and always been okay and comfortable and now he has to be alone. Your dog is going to do better if they haven't been panicking for 10 years. They're because it's you don't think of it as like your dog having different buckets. You've got a scary bucket, you've got a doesn't mean much neutral bucket, and you've got a good bucket. And if he is his scary bucket is full and piling over, it's gonna take longer for you to chip away at that than his neutral bucket, which he hasn't been freaking out for 10 years because he's been panicking when people leave him. So now you're just adding stuff over to the good bucket rather than having to chip away at the bad bucket before you can even get to the good bucket. Okay. Okay, so it looks like lived with a retired couple and has had a dog brother. We are a working couple and soon we go back to the office. The panic barking downstairs is recent. And the older couple seem to always be home. Same barking when we leave. So um, I think doing a, a, an assessment would be a good way to get started with that so that, um, so that you could see the body language uh, of what exactly is going on, what kind of barking. So if you watch part one, there's lots of different types of barking. Um, we can have, you know, frustrated barking. We can have um, anxiety barking, watchdog barking, all different kinds of barking. So we'd want to see what the rest of his body language is saying too. Um, you know, are you leaving him out and free? Is he in a crate? Um, those are sort of little things that are going to have factors into what's going on. So that will help and to be able to help to give you guidance. Um, it does though, if he does have separation anxiety, it, it will take time. Um, and I'm always straight up about that. It, it will take time and time as in more than a month. Um, I would say it, you know, I would say you know, a good guesstimate would be, you know, six months or longer, which also when I first heard that when my dog got, uh, was, diagnosed with separation anxiety, I was, you know, jaw dropping. Um, but there are things you can do as part of the management, you know, sounds like he lived with another dog. Um, so maybe he gets along with other dogs. So maybe he could do some daycare. Daycare is a, is a big thing that helps a lot of dogs who are social. Um, there's lots of different options now as far as Rover and things like that, where people are doing dog sitting in their home that you could drop the dog off. So there's different ways that you can get around to making sure that he is not experiencing the panic attacks uh, while you're working on getting him to feel better. But my own dog didn't get it until she was like six or seven, which is, is pretty late in life. Um, and so it, it, I think though she was one of those dogs that was kind of predisposed to it. She has, she was a pretty anxious girl. So uh, even with her old age though, I was, you know, able to help her. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Well, I thank you everybody who joined us um, for the live and thank you to Caroline for the questions and Victoria also for joining in and, and, um, please do feel free to reach out if you have any questions and when you're watching the recording feel free to make comments there I'd be happy to reply and point everybody and to useful resources and directions on how to get help um, We'll also be uploading this to YouTube for our YouTube fans and our Instagram followers um, All right, thank you all and have a good rest of your evening